I'll turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to talk about the race. And in chapter 4, starting in verse 6, we'll start there. Now, what do we know about 2 Timothy? That's the last epistle written by the Apostle Paul. All right, at least the last documented writings. And so this is at the end of Paul's life, the end of his race. And he says, in starting in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So I want to focus on this on verse 7 here. There, there's these three things that Paul says that he has done. And I think it's three things that as any believer needs to do. He says here that he has fought the good fight, he has finished the race, he has kept the faith. So he's fought, finished, and kept. All right? Not FFF, FFK, but you know, we'll <laughs> we're forgiven Paul for that, right? <laughs> Maybe in the Greek it was <laughs> the same letter, I don't know. Uh, but first off, we need to make sure because uh, some people think this is the Apostle Paul saying that you can lose your salvation. But I want to assure you that is not what this is saying because let's go to another verse in the Word that assures us of our salvation. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. And I'm, I'll just read these two verses, but you can not uh, note it down. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. All right, you see? So, if you're saved, you're sealed until that day, right? And it's a guarantee. So, you belay any fear if, you, if anybody here um, had that. You know, whenever I get a chance to come up here and share, I just feel like I'm always, like, preaching to the choir here. You know? I look out, and gosh, most of you guys I've known for over a decade. And, and those that I uh, haven't known that long, I just know just enough by just watching you that, man, you love the Lord and you study His Word. So I, I know I'm not up here sharing anything that you don't already know, but I just want to come up and just string these pearls together, as they say, you know, and just so that we can be encouraged tonight as we enter into communion. Um, so, our goal, like the Apostle Paul, we want to hear at the end, good, well done, good and faithful servant, right? You know, Matthew 25, 21. So, let's break apart these, uh, these three things here. I have fought the good fight, right? So, we are to fight the good fight. So, what is good? All right, and that's that's a, that's a question. You know, here good means honorable, right? Desirable, uh, but you know, it, good is one of those subjective words, isn't it? You know, because what does the world do today? They say evil is good and good is evil, right? So I, I thought, well, this should be easy. Let me just do a search through the Bible of what the Lord lists as being good. Uh, it's, there's no list. There's no list of this is good and this is good and this is good and this is good, right? You know? Um, but then it dawned on me, you know, how many here are parents? All right? And you say to your kids that you want something to be done a certain way, right? And you come home 
And you're like, well, you, you, you didn't do this. It, it wasn't on the list. Well, but didn't you know that, you know, by my telling how I wanted this part done, that obviously it means it translates to over here as well, but it wasn't on the list. Do we want to live by the letter of the law or do we want to live by the spirit of the law? We want to live by the spirit of the law. And this is what, you know, this is, this is where we have to come at this from, by the spirit of the law. So, in, like I said, interestingly, you know, inter interestingly, there isn't a nice list of what is good in the Bible because there's not enough ink and paper to list probably those things, right? But we know Psalm 7328 says, the Lord is good, right? As does Psalm 34, 8 and Psalm 100 and, uh, and verse 5 and Nahum 1, 7 and many more. We know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that then God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very, very good. Actually, it says very good, not just good, right? And in John 10, 11, what does our Lord tell us? I am the good shepherd, right? So by taking kind of those things, and I'm not going to go into more detail because, gosh, if we could spend the whole evening just diving into that, right? Uh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 37, verse 28 said, But for me, it is good to be near God. Now, there are uh, many verses, many, many, many verses, like Romans 12, 21 and Isaiah 5, 20, that tell us to do good, overcome evil with good, and woe to those who call evil good and good evil, right? Uh, but passages like Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6, tell us that if we delight in the law of the Lord, all that we do will prosper. Well, that's good, right? Delighting what God says is, is uh, good. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to what? Test everything. Well, test it against what? What Congress is saying is good today? No, against the truth, right? The unchangeable Word of God. All right? So we are to test everything, hold fast to what is good. Again, what matches the spirit of the law. All right, let's see. So this, so when, this means we have to know what the Word of God says, right? And this is why you are encouraged all the time. We encourage our children, and any time you're in ministry or in Sunday school class or whatever, whenever we get together, what do we say? Get your face in the book, right? Read the Word of God. So you have to continually have that, the Word just refreshing you. And, and it does other things as well as we read the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy, earlier on in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you want to do good? You want to fight the good fight, we, guess we have to start in the Word, and we have to live by the Word, right? Uh, so, all right, we're also called to imitate Christ. Remember, like, I am the Good Shepherd, right? So we are called to imitate the way Christ lived, what He thought, what He said. And we are also said are called to imitate those who are also imitating Christ. As Apostle Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? So think of some people in your life that you know that are walking with the Lord, all right? You can imitate the good that they are doing, right? Therefore, again, we need to know Jesus. We need to know his words. Ah, okay, you've heard this one, I'm sure, many times before. All right. You're a banker, right? And how do you know that a counterfeit bill comes across? Because you took this exhaustive class on all the different ways a counterfeit bill could look like? No. You're trained with real money. 
How does real money feel? How does it look? The ink, how is it printed, right? When it's wet, you know, how does it smudge, uh, you know, so on and so forth. That way, when the counterfeit bill comes across your table, you go, hmm, something doesn't seem right. I can't put my finger on it, but something's not right. Same thing. If we are studying what is good through the Word of God, then when something counterfeit comes along, all right, like some of these hucksters telling us some things, and you go, that just doesn't sound right, you know. He's 90% there maybe, but uh, it's just not always there. Have I, have I told you the story of my making bake, um, brownies, my brownie story? No? <laughs> Christy's like, no, please, not the brownie story. <laughs> I, I, I like to tell the, uh, the kids, yeah, because we always come into this discussion of, uh, you know, don't go, don't listen to that music or don't go see that movie. Well, there's, there's only one bad scene in the movie, right? You know, I'll close my eyes or I'll go out to the bathroom before that starts. Well, I say, all right, I tell you what, I'm going to make you some of my homemade brownies. And I put organic material in it. Uh, so what I do is I'll go in the backyard where my dog likes to go. Oh, no. And I take a, just a toothpick and just, just on the toothpick and I'll mix that in the brownie mix. It's just a little bit. I mean, there's a huge brownie bowl of brownie mix. It's just a bitty little bit, right? I make the brownies, bake them, cut them up, and serve them. You want one? You know? <laughs> but it just had a little bit of that stuff in it, right? But you don't want it, right? Well, how come we don't live like that with other things? So when you think of a movie, when you think of a show, and it's got some organic material in it, <laughs> Say, nope, I'm never going to eat that again or watch that again. Or <laughs> so fighting the good fight also means, you know what, we have to stand for what we know is good. Marriage. Uh, today, I believe the Senate is voting. I don't know if they voted or what they voted. Um, they call it the res respect Marriage Act. It is nothing but disrespect for marriage to legalize homosexuality, gay marriage um, in our country. Um, so we're going to stand for what we know is true. That doesn't mean we we take to the streets with rifles and pitchforks and and things like that and storm the Capitol. But when somebody says to you, talks about marriage, what do, what do you respond? This is what marriage is, according to, you know, to the Word of God, and this is, this is why. Um, more importantly, a little bit closer to home, how about your marriage? You know, you know what your marriage should be like, right? You need to fight for your marriage. Life, pro-life, and, and all this stuff that's going on. We know what the Word of God says. Homosexuality, we know, and all these other social ills, we know what the Word of God says on it. So, do we stand fast to the truth? Okay, let's bring it a little bit more closer in our families. Hmm. Sometimes, especially as our kids get older or uh, we get married and there's the in-laws, right? And they think different than we do. Are you just going to kowtow to whatever, you know, just to keep everything, you know, peaceful. Now, the word says that and if at all possible, we are to keep peace, right? To be peaceable. But when they start spouting evil as good, I, I say that's when, you know, as a believer, we have to fight the good fight. We have to say no. And if that means you don't get invited anymore, well, you know what? Then you don't have to have that case of indigestion ever again when you go over there. <laughs> All right, back to 2 Timothy 4, 7. The second part, I have finished the race. What good is it to be in a race and never to finish it? Now, there's many different ways we can make this analogy of, of running a race, right? Um, but I'm, I'm calling this the race of our faith. And so I'm in my race, and you're in your race. 
we're in different races, or we're, we're not all running the same race. So Pat, you don't need to worry about you know, me beating you or you beating me, right? This is not a competition amongst each other. If there's only one competitor, it is, it is yourself, right? Uh, but he has finished the race, and it's inferred that he has finished the race well, right? Um, you know, and the end of the race is what? When you meet Christ. That's, that's when your race is over, right? Uh, now, Paul is at the end of his race. He's, he knows soon that he's going to lose his head. Now, the Word of God doesn't tell us how the Apostle Paul died. But tradition tells us that, well, Peter was crucified upside down, and Paul was beheaded. He was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen, and Roman, Roman citizens are, were normally exempt from crucifixion. I, don't, I knew he was beheaded, but I didn't realize that was uh, possibly the reason why, because he was a Roman citizen. So Paul, the Apostle Paul likens our, our life um, to faithfulness. So that's our sanctification process, right? And I know our pastor has shared on our, the sanctification process for many, many times. And, and he relates this to the race that we're in. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 24. First Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus... Okay, listen to this. Not with uncertainty. He knows what he needs to do. It's clear. He sees where the goal at the end. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. L lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now we've all seen the Olympics, right? And we've seen, you know, all the trials and events that, and the races that lead up to the final event at, at the Olympics. Uh, gosh, they have TV shows on how thus and such athlete trained for seven years, right? You know, and we've even made movies of, of hockey teams that have won Olympic gold medals and, and what they had to do to get there, right? You know, it's all this discipline. It's all this training. You know what I'm going to say? We need to discipline ourselves in, in our spiritual lives, in our study lives, our thought lives. We, we need to be, you need to be your, your own worst critic. <laughs> That's not what the world wants us to say, is it? They, they, they want us to have high health, uh, high esteem. We want to hold ourselves into high esteem. But, you know, I have to say, Darren, you know what? You're just a no good, lousy guy, you know? You're a sinner. You need to make sure that you keep your face in the Word of God. As soon as you think you've arrived, that's when you are probably in the most danger, Darren. All right? We need to discipline ourselves and, and place our physical bodies, because it's not just our thought lives, it's our physical bodies as well. Why is that hand going into that cookie jar? You know? Thankfully, Christy got rid of cookie jars. But... Um, but, right? But why does my body want to do something I don't want it to do? And I find as I get older, my body doesn't want to do what I want to do. <laughs> we do not receive the prize if we do not finish the race of our faithfulness, right? And, and we have seen so many people drop out of their race, haven't we? Um, but I guess I will ask this. Did they drop out because they were never saved? 
right? Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that go, wow, you know what? Man, I like that. I, I like how that person's life is. I, Pastor Rich just seems to have such a cool life. You know, I want to do what he does. And I want to be like him, right? And so, oh, he talks this way and he dresses this way and he, he carries his Bible this way and he has this brand of Bible. I want to get that, right? And, and these people just learn how to imitate a Christian. They're in the church, right? They're not in Christ. And they drop out. We don't know, though, do we? I, you know, if somebody has dropped out of the race and they're still breathing, there's still a chance that they're just waylaid. You know, the enemy is just kind of sidetracked them, right? And, and they're going to come back. Until they die, we don't know. They, and even then, I don't really know, do I? Because who knows the heart? That's just God, God does. But, you know, as fruit inspectors, and we just, you know, we, that's the only thing that we can do as believers, we can see just how, you know, wow, Ed is doing this. Wow, Ed is a, must be a strong believer because it fits all the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? So on and so forth. And, you know, and John, oh, he's not doing anything. So, gosh, we need to pray for John. I need to, you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. But but we that, but the point is we just don't know. And so we also can't come to a priest, you know, we, we can't make these conclusions, presuppositions about other people. What's what's our greatest tool that the Lord has given us to be able to stand on our own feet and, and to help others stand before the Lord? Prayer. That, that's our number one ob, you know, offensive we weapon, isn't it? Prayer. Um, now I was thinking, I won't tell you where I was, you know, before I got here, you know, getting ready to come. But um, I was standing there and, I, and I'm like thinking, you know, this race. Well, I'm, I'm running this race. And, you know, what do you normally have um, at a race you have, on the sidelines? You have the crowds, right? Right? And cheering, go, go, Darren, go, right? You know? And I'm um, like thinking, wow, those people that are cheering me on, those are the people in my life that are praying for me. Right? They're, they're encouraging me. Go, go, go around the corner. The finish line is just one more bend. It's, it's there. You know, it's smoother. Don't worry. You know, you can get up this hill, right? Um, you know, the, good, the sun's going to come out, you know, because it's storming on you right now, and so on and so forth. But then I, then I realized, well, Darren, you kind of just stole that from the footprint <laughs> analogy of, you know, oh, no, 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 because there's more. I'm sorry, I jumped. I forgot. Remember I said, Pastor, I, I hope I remember everything the Lord <laughs> shared with me. But uh, so I'm running this race, right? And then all of a sudden, I just feel so weak. And there's a wheelbarrow comes up behind me and just scoops me up. And just starts pushing me down the, down the racetrack, right? And I look back, and who is it? That's the Holy Spirit. He's got me. All right. And then he goes, okay, we're up here. Dump, uh, and then I can take off again as I'm, I'm rested. Right. So that's when I realized I stole that from footprints, you know, the sand thing, you know, where there's now there's only one, one set of footprints in the sand. And, and the person's like, Lord, where did you go? And the Lord's like, no, no, those are mine. That's when I carried you. Right. You know, so I go, well, Lord, where are my footprints? No, that, that one line is the wheelbarrow <laughs> wheel. I kept pushing you down the race. Galatians 6.6. 6. Let's turn there. Hmm. Now, let's scrap that. We're running out of time. We need to, uh, I need to finish so that y'all can have time for communion tonight. So, uh, all right, back to 2 Timothy 4.7. Let's go to the third one. I have kept the faith. I'll save that for another time. All right. You've heard it from this pulpit many, many times. First, let's be clear. It is who that keeps us? It is the Holy Spirit that keeps us, right? All right. We can read that in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. I'll read that real quick. You know, again, we, and we, we read that earlier. You were sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Right? He keeps us. So if you're saved, you're going to finish the race. I don't know what kind of condition you're going to be in when you get across the finish line, right? But you will finish the race. That is a guarantee, right? And we know this word uh, to keep means to guard, right, as, w- uh, as well. And so, you know, we, we need to keep the faith. We need to guard the faith. And, and we can read this in a couple of ways, right? When Paul says, I have kept the faith, um, we could say, well, Paul has faithfully declared the gospel and guarded its truth, keeping its message pure, unadulterated, right? Or we can say Paul has fulfilled his divine appointment in this world that he would be Jesus' messenger to the Gentiles, right? Either way, though, however that is to be interpreted, uh, we know that the Apostle Paul did both of these things. So I have to ask myself, Darren, are you keeping the faith? Am I living and sharing a pure gospel, the unadulterated gospel? As the Apostle Paul said, right, I am not ashamed, right, to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power, right? You know, but not just in word. It's easy to use words. I, mean, I know words have power, but it's, uh, words can be cheap, you know, but by deed. You know, again, it is said that you know, your life may be the only gospel somebody ever gets to, to see, right? So how are, you, how are your deeds? Are they pure? You know, also, just like the Apostle Paul, am I fulfilling my calling? We all have a calling. You know, first as a man, am I fulfilling the duties of man, of a man, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a pastor, as a leader, et cetera, et cetera. You should ask yourself those same questions. Your list might be different. Christy, as a woman, obviously, and a wife, you know. But am I fulfilling my calling? Am I keeping the faith? Now, as you read the Apostle Paul's letters, right, and other accounts, he is always with other believers. You ever notice that? You know, even at the end of this epistle, if you turn, was it verse 19? No, verse 21. The, the second half there, you know, Abulus greet you as well as Peters and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. So he's with other believers. What do you think they're doing to Paul? Encouraging him, you know, praying for him, right? And I, and I looked at all the all of his epistles, and at the end he's either saying, "Hey," or at the beginning, "I'm with," you know. Timothy, I'm with Titus, or this is written to, you know, and -and so-and-so here, you know, with me wants you to say hi to the brethren and so on and so forth, right? And we read earlier uh, in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, that we let us consider one another in order to stir up good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some but, some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So not only is it good for us to be together for encouragement, but we're also commanded that we should be together, especially as we're getting to the end, right? So we need this, this communion or this fellowship that we, that we have with one another to help us to keep the faith. And isn't it so much easier to work with somebody when you're working on something, you know, than trying to do it all alone, right? And so, you know, trying to get a segue from from here into communion, right? You know, and so we need that communion also with the Holy Spirit. And so we've come, we come together on the first Wednesday of the month, right, to have communion with the Lord. And as John Michael said on Sunday, you know, he's like, you know, start preparing for Wednesday night. 
but I, I was thinking about that. I, you know, we need to be preparing every single day, all right? Not just for tonight, because I certainly hope that this isn't the only chance that you get to have communion with the Lord, right? And I, when I mean communion, I don't, I don't necessarily mean bread and, and juice. I also just mean just having fellowship with the Lord. We need to keep that list, you know. You're saved, right? Yeah? Does that mean you're, you no longer sin? No, you do, right? We do. We're sinners saved by grace. But as it has been said, hopefully we sin less, right? We're not sinless, but we, hopefully we start sinning less. But we still have a list of things that we need to take care of. You know, maybe when you started out, your list was like this. And the Lord has been working through you over the years as you mature. And, right? and maybe, maybe your list, you know, you don't procrastinate. I am a huge procrastinator. I will wait, you know, until the very last minute to do something. I used to say in college that, um, you know, the first day of school, I'm two weeks behind, right? Because I, I I, I'm a procrastinator. Um, but one thing I've learned over the years, and I think many of you have as well, is that when we trip up, when we make mistakes, we don't just let it sit on the list for a long period of time. You just immediately go to the Lord, and you just take care of it. And it's once and done, It's right? And it's taken care of. Let's turn to 1 John 1. Starting in verse 5. This is a favorite passage just on, on fellowship and how to have communion with the Lord. The title I have uh, in, in my Bible is Fellowship with Him and One Another. First, uh, First John 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So, if you have any unconfessed sin, you need to take care of that before you come to the communion table. And if you've kept your list short, it should be fairly easy, right? That means you've been having communion with the Lord all week, keeping that list nice and, and tidy and, and neat. Uh, but we are warned in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 through 29, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we just, we just need to take note of that. And again, I'm looking out, I'm preaching to the choir. Right. Um, so sum it up, right? It's not easy being a Christian. Right? And unfortunately, in this world, uh, churches just like to sell this easy believism. You know, put, raise your hand up, say a you know, 30 second prayer, and you're done, and go on and go do whatever you want. But that's not what the Word of God says, according to my Bible at least. 
There's tribulation in this world. There are attacks. My gosh, how many times did the Apostle Paul get stoned? Right? And this race that we're in. How do you, how do you fail at anything? How do you... You quit. You quit. The only way... How do you say that, Pastor? The only way to fail... You can't lose if you don't give up. Can't lose if you don't give up. Now, Pastor Ritt has something in common with another really, really smart guy. Albert Einstein. He said... You never fail until you stop trying. Very similar, right? So I'll put you both, you know, in the same. <laughs> How many here read um, streams in the desert on a regular basis? You read today's stream, right? I just wanted to give you this, this kind of little quote um, that they had at, at the top. Um, it's based off of 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Uh, Quit you like men, be strong. Uh, it says, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work shall be no miracle, but you shall be a miracle. As God works through you, right? But this is a quote from Philip, Phillips Brooks. So I hope all of us can, can safely say at the end of our lives, and we may be around the corner, all right? As our pastor's getting excited, and September's coming soon, right? You know? But I hope we could all say that we have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Let's pray.